and I'm back. Let's cut to the chase. The catch is one of the most famous plays in the history of baseball. It's up there with Babe Ruth's called shot and Benji Molina's triple to complete the cycle. To make it 5-4, there goes Benji again. Now could this be a triple? Come on! You got the, you got the cycle, big guy! Get there! Get there! He did it! Look at that big fella hustle. But for sports fans of the digital age, the play's popularity can be a source of contention. There have been some remarkable outfield snags over the years, like Jim Edmonds' sprawling catch in Kauffman Stadium, Gary Matthews Jr.'s acrobatics, or Kevin Pillar scaling the wall like he's on Ninja Warrior. The footage from those plays is readily available. They come from a time when baseball games were broadcast for all to see. But in the 1950s, broadcast baseball was in its infancy, and as a result, this episode of Baseball Bits will be very much a study in what we can unpack from older video footage. Back to my thesis though, the brilliance of those three aforementioned catches is immediate. Even if you aren't a die-hard baseball fan or sports fan, they look impossible. But grainy footage of Willie Mays making a basket catch on the run? We're going to need historical context, reference points, and even a healthy scooping of StatCast data. Only then will we be able to explain one of the most misunderstood plays in all of sports. So let's get to answering the questions plaguing the minds of many. How does the catch stack up in 2019? Does it deserve the praise that has been heaped upon it? I think if you were to ask someone what the greatest catch of 2018 was, there'd be a couple ways of looking at it. I'm partial to this obscene catch by Billy Hamilton against the Pirates. The amount of ground covered in the dive are just terrific. Francisco Cervelli, the hitter who struck the ball, was impressed as well. But it's just from the first inning of a June regular season game between two teams that didn't come particularly close to a playoff berth. Let's ramp up the stakes. You'll probably recognize this play. Benintendi sells out with the bases loaded to win Game 4 of the ALCS. If the ball gets past him, the entire series dynamic changes. It's a wonderful play, but is it better than Hamilton's catch in a vacuum? No, of course not. Billy Hamilton is so fast, he might have been able to make this catch on the run, and that's no criticism of Benintendi, who is a great defender in left field. But because of the context in which this play was made, fans will remember the Benintendi catch more fondly. That's why the MLB upload of it has 127,000 views, whereas the Hamilton catch has... yeah, you get my point. So here's your context with Willie Mays. It's Game 1 of the 1954 World Series, with Mays' New York Giants taking on the Cleveland Indians in the polo grounds. We're in the top of the 8th with the score tied 2-2, and future Hall of Famer Larry Doby stands on second base as the go-ahead run. At the plate is lefty Vic Wirtz, who has already hit a two-run triple in the first inning that gave the Indians their only runs. He has also collected two more hits on the day, so he's really not the guy you want to be facing with runners in scoring position. He was a pretty well-known player at the time, too. Wirtz had a very respectable slash line, racked up 27.4 wins above replacement, and made four All-Star games in his 17-year career. And who is Willie Mays in this moment? It seems like a silly question to ask, but he still had a whole career in front of him at this point. He was a 23-year-old Say Hey Kid who had just come off his breakout season after returning from the Army. The numbers? They'd be right at home on Mike Trout's baseball reference page, that's for sure. It's no wonder that Mays won his first MVP that season. That's part of what makes the timing of this play so special. Think of it as a coming out party for a legend in the making. So here's the tricky thing with the catch. There's a few grainy camera angles and ways to watch it, but if we're going to make some sense out of this play, we'll have to use every single source available to us. So we have footage A, which I call the wide. Its main feature is a continuous wide angle shot of Maze chasing down the ball. Then there's footage B, which I downloaded from MLB's YouTube channel. The main difference is we cut to a closer angle at the end. Then there's footage C, much clearer. It's from the National Archives and pieces together a couple shots in rapid succession. I'm going to be studying three facets of this catch, and the first is the sprint that Mays makes to the ball. The questions I'm trying to answer are how much ground did he cover, and how much time did it take him. You'd think timing him would be easy, but it's not. Old film footage has a tendency to be played at speeds either a bit too fast or a bit too slow. In footage A, Mays catches the ball 5.83 seconds after it leaves the bat. In footage B, 3.67, and in footage C, 4.57. There's also no angle available that shows the ball both leave Wurtz's bat and end up in Mays' glove. All the video one can find is just bits and pieces of various angles that have been edited together after the fact. That's when I discovered the hunch. No, not a hunch as in a gut feeling, a hunch as in Larry Doby, the base runner, hunched over as he decides whether to tag up at second base or not. This moment of indecision is the key to the whole study. 
In the National Archives footage, we see Vic Wirtz strike the ball and Dobie in the hunch. In the wide-angle upload, we see Dobie in the hunch and Maze make the snag. The total time when you combine these two sources? 5.7 seconds. That's how long it took for Maze to become immortal. The distance covered requires a little more guesstimation. We need two points, where Maze started his run and where he caught the ball. For the latter, I determined that Maze made the snag right of center, and a couple of strides before the warning track. The polo grounds were 483 feet to dead center at that time, but Maze is at this funky wall labeled in this diagram, which I downloaded from Andrew Klim's baseball blog, link in the description, yada yada. So I can place Maze's endpoint pretty confidently around here, but what about his starting point? Every piece of video has Maze already in motion. I did notice, however, that he likely was playing shaded a little bit towards right field, likely due to Wirtz being a left-handed hitter. Outfielders weren't shifting all over the place back then, but it wasn't foreign concept either. I decided I'd look at StatCast positioning data from Baseball Savant, and found that center fielders in Maze's situation, defending against a left-handed hitter with a run in scoring position, stood 318 feet back and 3 degrees to the right on average. But where would Maze stand? That's where we get into a little game theory. The polo grounds were so vast that a ball that got over your head was going to be a home run either way. It really wasn't that much different to a regular sized ballpark. The only difference being that the resulting home run would be an inside the parker. Then there's Larry Doby on second. If Wirtz hits a single, Mays will want to be playing up to potentially gun down the go ahead run at home. And then I went to the Willie Mays page on the National Baseball Hall of Fame website and read the two most magical words that described Mays' positioning. Playing shallow. So while Starling Marte would play this situation about 318 feet from home plate, we're going to go with the center fielder who likes to play the most shallow, and that's Jake Marisnik at 308 feet. We'll keep the slide angle to the right as well. That gives us approximately 115 feet covered in 5.7 seconds. Would the typical major leaguer be able to make this play today? Thanks to StatCast, we're about to find out. We're back on Baseball Savant, and this time we're looking at StatCast catch rates. If we're pretty sure Maze covered 115 feet of ground in 5.7 seconds, we can figure out just how often that play is made. StatCast has recorded only 31 batted balls in which an outfielder had to cover between 110 and 120 feet in 5.7 seconds. Of those 31 balls, 22 of them hit the ground. Only 29% of outfielders have been successful in making this kind of play. But StatCast has another feature called Catch Probability. It puts a lot of weight into the ground covered and time needed, but it also introduces another very important factor, the angle. It's much easier to make a catch running towards home plate than it is running away from it. In making the catch, Mace has the Herculean task of covering ground at a dead sprint while he tracks the ball over his shoulder. Here's a catch from Lorenzo Cain that is eerily, and I mean eerily similar to Mace. 5.7 seconds, 114 feet, running towards the wall, and a stat cast catch probability of 2% like the freaking milk, baby! StatCast catch probability has a fourth factor as well, and that's proximity to the wall and whether it made the catch more difficult. In Kane's case, it definitely did. In Mays, maybe not so much. But it's also clear that Mays is taking a more difficult angle to the ball, which would have likely balanced out the overall degree of difficulty. In the opinion of StatCast, the chances of Willie Mays making this catch are slim to none. Keep in mind, this is a ball hit about 425 feet deep according to our and most people's estimates. Where Willie Mays is standing when he makes this catch would be in the bleachers of any modern ballpark. Here's what 420 feet looks like in the Christian Yelich friendly confines of Miller Park. And here's what it looks like in Oracle Park's Triples Alley, where homers go to die. And yet, here's Mays tracking down a ball that would be impossible to catch in any other MLB stadium. There can never be another catch like this one, because today's ballpark simply can't accommodate it. So let's talk about what happened after he caught the ball. Once again, the limitations of footage available make things difficult on us. After making his miraculous snag, we see Mays turn and throw the ball towards second base, but we don't really get a camera angle that allows us to track the throw. The thing that stands out to me is how quickly Mays goes from making such a difficult catch to immediately throwing the ball towards the infield. In that crispy National Archives footage, the amount of time between the ball landing in Mays' glove and being released from Mays' hands is 1.3 seconds of turnaround time. The amount of athleticism on display is tremendous, as you'd be hard pressed to find another example of an outfielder stopping on a dime in similar circumstances. Ramon Laureano made an insane throw in 2018 after a catch took his momentum the opposite direction, but it took him 2.9 seconds to get the ball out of his hands. These aren't directly comparable, because Laureano's throw did this, and Willie Mays just wanted to get it back to the infield as quick as possible. 
which is still no easy feat considering how deep he was. Recognize that Maze takes no time to gather or double clutch. He's just getting that sucker in. Why the rush? He's trying to prevent Larry Doby scoring from second base. It actually happens more often than you think. In 2019, four base runners have managed to score from second on sack flies. Here's a combination of a stumbling Malik Smith and a speedy Billy Hamilton. But Larry Doby wasn't a speed demon, so how about Willie Calhoun scoring from second after Jacoby Jones ricochets off the wall? Mays could have easily ran into the wall or had his feet come out from under him while catching that ball, but he stays upright and fires in a ball that prevents Doby from scoring the go-ahead run. The fans in the polo grounds erupt. They have just witnessed something special, and I hope all of you watching this feel the same way. Now it's time to find out how this game ended. Giant star reliever Marv Grissom came in and got the final two outs of the 8th. The game ended up going to the 10th, and that's where the irony set in a little bit. Facing future Hall of Famer Bob Lemon, Mays walked and stole second base. Lemon then intentionally walked Hank Thompson, bringing up Dusty Rhodes to the plate. Here's what happened. Rhodes cuts at the first pick. And there goes the ball down the right field line. A home run into the seats and the ball game's over. The irony is pretty apparent. Willie Mays saved the game for the Giants when Vic Wirtz hit a 425-foot flyout, then scored the game-winning run on the ultimate cheap shot home run. That sign says 294 feet, but in reality, the distance down the right field line in the polo grounds was 258 feet. Wirtz's flyout to Mays would have been a home run in any MLB stadium, and Rose's home run would have been a simple flyout outside of the polo grounds. Having been propelled by their miraculous Game 1 victory, the Giants would go on to sweep the series, especially impressive considering that Cleveland had an incredible 104-50 record in the regular season. They were the favorites. Mays was named World Series MVP, and of course, was named regular season MVP that year as well. And thus, the legend was born, and the catch is something that people still talk about 65 years later. And in my opinion, having studied out the hang time, distance covered, throw, and context within the game, all that praise is well deserved. Yeah, that's right, Tristan. Go ahead, pack your things. Pack your things. I want to hear a word from you. I want to hear a word from you. You're fired. We all know that. You got to get out of here. And quite frankly, you're lucky I don't feed you to the alligators. <laughs>